Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mop and coming at you with another A Push video. This time we're taking a look at topic 6.8, focusing in on immigration uh, into the United States and migration within the United States during the Gilded Age. And once again, when we say Gilded Age, that's just a, a synonym for the late 19th century in the United States. So, uh, you know, at a time where we are seeing, you know, the, uh, the South uh, trying to redefine itself to some degree where we were becoming a more industrialized uh, nation. We are also seeing tremendous changes in the ethnic uh, makeup of the United States and where people are going to be living. So let's first take a look at how America is going to become more diverse as a result of immigration. If you take a look from about 1850 to 1910, you're going to be seeing approximately 25 million immigrants coming into the United States. That's an amazing amount of people. And, you know, it's important to understand why these folks will be coming into the United States. Uh, we tend to define these reasons as push factors and pull factors. So a push factor is something that is going on in somebody's home country that is problematic and is going to make somebody want to leave, okay? So, for example, there were a lot of Europeans at that time period that were becoming displaced as farmers. Their farms were failing uh, due to growing industrialization that was going to be going on. Many of these immigrants are going to be leaving because of, you know, political instability, uh, revolutions, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these folks are going to be coming over uh, due to, you know, crowded urban areas or, you know, perhaps religious persecution, for example, you know, Jews in Russia. Uh, so those are all going to be push factors. In other words, things are going to be happening in their home country is going to make them want to leave. Now, of course, if you leave your home country, you could go anywhere, you know, conceivably in the world. And we did see a lot of these immigrants end up going to Canada and parts of South America, Australia, amongst other locations. But why come to the United States specifically? Well, that would be what we would describe as a pull factor. A pull factor means like why you would come to this particular country. And, you know, probably not a big surprise for many of you, uh, the United States is going to be seen as a land of opportunity. Uh, there's a, going to be a large demand for uh, laborers in America's factories. There's going to be religious freedom that's going to be protected. There's going to be political freedom that is going to be protected. You know, America's, you know, civil liberties are going to be probably the, the broadest in the world at this time period. Uh, if you had some money in your pocket, there was land uh, to be, land to buy. Uh, so, you know, there were a number of reasons why one would want to come to the United States. Now, note, uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, immigration, be mindful of, you know, different, you know, major waves of immigration that are going to be happening in the United States. This is a really good synthesis topic. You know, if you can take a look at different periods of, of large waves of immigration and be able to differentiate between them. And when we talk about 19th century immigration, uh, particularly pre-Civil War or, you know, maybe during the Civil War era, we tend to call that historically old immigration. And these old immigrants are going to be primarily coming from Northern and Western Europe. So you're talking about people from uh, Britain and uh, the Netherlands and France and Belgium and Germany, Scandinavia, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the vast majority of those immigrants were Protestant, be it, you know, uh, Anglicans, uh, be it, uh, you know, Dutch Reformed Protestants, uh, you know, Lutherans, whatever. Uh, although there, was, there were some minority uh, Catholics that were coming over, especially amongst the Irish. Some of the French were Catholics as well. Uh, but yeah, overwhelmingly Protestants. Uh, and note, you know, most of these old immigrants, this wave of old immigrants, came over uh, and generally settled in uh, rural areas, uh, particularly in the Midwest, uh, unless you were, you know, I mean, and note, you know, a lot of these folks, for example, were like German immigrants. Uh, but if you were very poor coming over, like the Irish commonly were, uh, you didn't have really the financial means to purchase land and ended up settling and working in the, you know, the growing cities of America at that time. And, you know, you know, when we talk about, you know, transitioning from the old wave of immigrants, you know, from the Civil War era to the, 
newer wave of immigrants that are going to be happening during the industrial era, you know, late 19th and into the beginning of the 20th century, uh, one thing that's going to differentiate these two waves is that these newer immigrants, as are going to start to be called, are generally going to be poorer than previous waves of immigrants. Uh, and so if you were poor coming over, uh, you very commonly could only afford what was called steerage class on a boat. As you can see here, the steerage class is the bottom uh, part of the boat. Uh, you know, you didn't have, I mean, you can see the outside here, but most of the time, this, most of the space that you had uh, was indoors. You didn't really have a lot of outside space. It was cramped. It was crowded. The food was not so great. Uh, but, you know, that was about all you could afford. And for some of these folks, that was all literally that they had to their name. They spent on passage coming over to the United States. And, you know, coming over is going to be, you know, rough experience. You know, in these steerage class cabins, uh, communicable diseases could spread very quickly. Uh, you had folks that were there that were from various parts of uh, Europe, for example. And so a lot of different religious practices and ethnic uh, languages and things like that. So that could be maybe a bit overwhelming. Uh, and then when you did, you know, make it over, you know, to the United States over the course of, uh, you know, less than two weeks, uh, you know, we started to see the opening up of Ellis Island and then going through all of the uh, procedural things to determine whether or not you're allowed to stay in the United States or have to return. The vast majority, of course, are going to be allowed to enter into the United States. But, you know, for some of those folks, that process took a while, especially if you were sick. And so, you know, just getting over here as an immigrant at this time is not going to be a simple, easy experience. Something else that's going to be defining uh, this newer wave of immigrants uh, is the fact that they're going to be mostly coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. So now you're talking about you know, folks that are Italian and Greek and Slovak and Polish and Russian, uh, you know, etc. So you got a lot of those folks that are now that are now coming over, uh, different than what we had ever really seen before. Uh, and in addition to different ethnicities, you're also going to be seeing, you know, a a difference in the overall religious affiliations of these newer immigrants. You know, in the past it was overwhelmingly Protestant. The Irish being, you know, a big exception of Catholics. Well, now it's going to be mostly Catholic immigrants that are going to be coming over. I mean, if you are Italian, if you are Polish, you know, you are almost certainly going to be Catholic. But beyond that, you're going to have a lot of Eastern Orthodox Christians coming over, folks from uh, Russia and Greece and Serbia. Uh, and then you're going to have a sizable Jewish immigrant population coming from Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe. So you are seeing a much more ethnically and religiously diverse group of people now entering into the United States uh, from Europe. And, you know, with the vast majority being pretty poor, as you saw with the Irish before them, generally coming to the big cities like New York and Philadelphia and Chicago and, you know, places like Detroit, you know, Boston, and trying to find factory work there and living there. Uh, but also be aware that something else that is going to be defining this, this new period of immigration uh, are a big increase in immigrants coming from Asia, uh, especially from China, but also from places like Japan, Korea, and the Philippines. Uh, but the Chinese are certainly going to be coming over in the largest numbers and are going to be getting the most attention. Now, Whereas, you know, Eastern immigrants are going to be coming through places like Boston and New York. Uh, Asian immigrants are going to be coming through mostly through San Francisco, perhaps, uh, you know, Seattle. Uh, and therefore settling mostly on the western coast of the United States. Now, uh, many of these uh, Asian immigrants are going to be finding work in the railroad industry, uh, at, you know, as laborers. But you're going to be seeing, you know, Asian workers in all sorts of different fields. Uh, in some cases, opening up their own businesses. Now, in this time of great change, industrially and in terms of the ethnic and religious makeup of uh, the United States, there's going to be, you know, a growing concern about, you know, you know, what's going to happen to native-born Americans. And I'm not talking about Native Americans. I'm talking about, you know, the concerns of white Americans that were born here, saying, oh, well, what's going to happen to America? You know, it used to kind of have this certain culture and certain values, and, you know, now it's perhaps under attack. And we'll talk 
more about this in general when we cover this idea of nativism that is certainly going to be uh, you know, a component of this. But when we do take a look at discrimination and you know, nativism directed at one particular group of immigrants, it's certainly going to be most directed towards the Chinese. Uh, you know, white laborers on the West Coast are going to feel that Chinese uh, workers are going to be undercutting them in terms of their wages. Uh, you know, unlike, you know, Europeans that are coming in from, say, Italy and Russia and Poland that were all Christian, at least, from the minds of white Americans, you know, Chinese immigrants are not Christians. Uh, you know, it's seemingly... They speak an alien language and have an alien religion. They have an alien way of, of dressing. And so they're going to be seen as, you know, the most alien of these immigrants and therefore not just an economic threat, but also a cultural threat. Well, due to these, you know, nativist, racist fears that are going to be prevalent for many uh, on the West Coast, you're going to see Congress actually approve a, a pretty diabolical piece of legislation and that's going to be the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. What this will do is specifically bar Chinese immigrants from coming into the United States. Uh, and note, this is the first time we've ever singled out a specific ethnicity to bar from entering into the United States. I mean, this was unprecedented and, you know, clearly racist in its intentions. Uh, and what's going to be stunning is that this is going to stay on the books for many years, actually, uh, before it will be repealed. Uh, and so it kind of shows you that, you know, there is going to be, to some degree, uh, a racist nativist response to the changes that are going to be happening uh, during this, uh, you know, Gilded Age period. Okay. All right. We're going to leave it here uh, for right now. We'll uh, finish this topic up in our next video. We'll see you next time.